slides. Are you ready? Yep, it's done. You're on the second slide now. Okay. And I'm going to... Okay. Um, tell you a little bit about the previous South and Ham Fest and why it's a little different than Dayton. Uh, number one, the Friedrich Conference Ham Fest is held in quite a professional convention and expo center. It's not a very old place. It's about 12 years old. Uh, it's sponsored by DARC, which is the German version of the ARRL. And, but yet the convention, even though the DARC kind of uh, sponsors the thing, it's actually run professionally by the convention center itself, and that's the Friedrich Conference. It's held at Mesa Friedrichshafen, which is next to the Friedrichshafen Airport. In fact, if you look out the back, there's the runway. You are literally on the back side of the airport, right across the runway from the uh, airline terminal. Uh, this year, they occupied four halls for the exhibit, plus a hall for seminars, and another hall for the youth camp. This year was the first year they had a maker fair. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with maker fairs. Oh, yeah, we know what those are. Okay, well, that was 3D printers and the whole shebang there. Uh, quite a deal. Uh, and that was in Hall A5. And uh, they also had a small exhibit there by the German club uh, uh, showing off some different small kit radios, which uh, I thought was pretty cool they had in there as well. It's a very international convention. In fact, there are flags of each country that are hung over every booth by uh, the facility. So like our booth was, I, I was working for DARA, which is the Dayton Amateur Radio Association. I was sent there by them to be in their booth to promote coming to the Dayton Handvention. And because I'm kind of a character at Dayton wearing a uh, cat and hat hat, uh, I wore it there, which brought a lot of people who wanted to take selfies and so forth with me and uh, brought a lot of attention to our booth and a lot of good attention to the Dayton Hamvention. But if you went to a booth that was from a particular country, you would see a flag of that country hanging over it. Uh, clubs and organizations actually occupied over 50% of the main commercial exhibit hall, which is a lot different than the Dayton Hamvention. In Dayton, the clubs and organizations are spread around throughout the complex. They can be just about anywhere, and they're not often next to each other. At Friedrichshafen, all the clubs and organizations were all in the one half of the building, and commercial exhibits took up the other half, and then there were two large halls that were nothing but flea markets. And the flea market, I have to tell you, was almost exactly like flea markets here, except for you had Cold War radios and things like that, which was kind of a lot of fun. Uh, Kind of like Dayton, where they serve beer, they certainly do in Germany. In fact, the first thing people asked me was, do you like beer because you're going to Germany? And I said, well, I'm not a big beer drinker, but I'll try it. And uh, it is definitely good and definitely a lot different. And there's people who do drink a lot of beer there. It's also an on-site campground where people have their little camper trailers, but it was very densely packed in compared to what we would uh, call a campground. So let's uh, change to the next slide, so from the air. Okay. Okay. In this shot, what you're looking at, you'll see the building complex for this, and to the right of the building, you'll see a large parking lot full of cars. Uh, there's a building that looks like a hangar, and that actually is home of Zeppelins, real live Zeppelins that they uh, fly from the airport. But the, the largest arch building in the row of buildings is the main exhibit hall, and then there's kind of a plaza in the middle, and that's where the beer garden is, and then you see all the different uh, arch roof buildings, and those are the flea market uh, halls, the maker fairs, there was a youth hall, things like that, uh, all along in a row. Uh, the hand fest takes up a little less than half of the space that this place actually could afford it, so it has plenty of room to expand, and unlike Dayton, Everything is indoors except for the beer garden and the smoking area. Um, but uh, uh, as you can see, there's a lake right next to the city of Friedrichshafen. And on the other side of the lake, you see the mountains. Those mountains are the Swiss Alps. That is Switzerland right across that lake. 
and it's not very far. It's only about a 30, 40 minute ride by boat to get to the other side of the lake. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, one of the features of this ham fest that I wish they would incorporate in all of our ham fests is the QSO wall. It's done at most European ham fests. We really should do this here. What they do is they take an entire wall, and I mean, this is a huge, huge wall. I don't think anybody can get a picture of the entire thing without doing a panorama. And there were people with the iPhones uh, going back and forth taking panoramas of it. Uh, everybody plastered their QSL cards on the wall, and you'll see that in my uh, slideshow. In fact, it's the opening slide in the background is a tiny, very tiny part of the huge QSL wall. Uh, there are uh, large eating areas, and then even a sit-down restaurant with uh, wait staff to serve you on a balcony overlooking one of the lobby areas of the convention. Um, kind of a far cry from Air Arena. Lots of German beer, I guess i got to say that again. Uh, the club booths were a lot of fun. Uh, the clubs would be things like the ARL had a booth, and they did mostly uh, DXCC card checking and uh, worked all states card checking and things like that. Um, the Slovenia Radio Club had a booth, and Croatia, and the Swiss Club, and there was four or five different Italian clubs that had booths. And then there was one giant booth that had four or five different clubs from France. And almost every one of those things had bottles of wine or beer on the uh, table when you would walk up to their club booth, as well as some snacks like pretzels and cookies and things like that. Sometimes the usual candy bowls you see at trade shows here. Um, and a lot of the clubs would have uh, tables inside their booth. And what they would do is they'd invite you to come in and sit down. They didn't necessarily want to sell you a membership to their club. They just wanted to get to know you. And it was really a lot of fun. Uh, they would quite often hold up a little cup that I would say would be about a two ounce cup, uh, a little plastic cup. And then they would start pouring wine in there. And you, you pointed one or two fingers at it, which meant one or two centimeters for, full of wine. And of course, they get up to two centimeters with me, and you go, whoops, and they pour a little more in there. And then you raise your cups and you say, Prost, which is cheers in German. And you could probably make about three or four club booth visits before you had to go back to your own club booth and sit down. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, the uh, kid building area was actually right behind our booth, and it belonged to DARC. But different than a lot of kit build things I've ever seen at Hamfest here, they had an instructor across the table from each builder. So it was always a one-on-one -on -one kit building experience. And you'll see that in some of my photos in the slideshow. Uh, mostly were kit building, but there were some adults as well. Uh, the instructors ranged in age from about 14 years old all the way up to in their 70s. Uh, they had an uh, all-day and night youth program where the kids camped out in one of the halls, one of the other halls uh, that was near the maker fair, and they uh, had a campfire thing out in the campgrounds for them at night, and uh, they had special event stations. There were several different youth groups also that operated, including the Scouts, and uh, there were other special event stations as well by DARC and some of the other individual club booths uh, had special event stations on the air, uh, three of which allowed me to get on the air and try and make contacts back to the States, but the band was in terrible condition that weekend, so I didn't get a chance to. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, the getting there. Okay, you're there. Okay. Fingerkoffen is really a small town of about 20, 30,000 people. It's in the southwest part of Germany at the southern edge at Lake Constance. Uh, the Germans call that big lake there both of these. Uh, to fly there for the longest leg of the trip, it's about eight and a half hours to get there and over nine, nine and a half hours to get back for the longest overseas leg. Uh, I went through Chicago. I was on the United, went from Omaha to Chicago, Chicago to Frankfurt, and then Frankfurt to Friedrichshafen. Uh, it is difficult to get flights into Friedrichshafen because it is a very, very tiny little airport. So 
So, of course, you're going to get most of the regional jets or, or uh, charter flights and so forth. So a lot of people flew into uh, Munich and took the train or into Zurich and took a train and then the ferry boat across the lake. What's cool is over there, their public transportation system is highly integrated. You're able to take high-speed trains that literally show up in the near, next to the baggage claim area of the major airport, and then away you go. It, it's pretty slick. Um, I would check the fares for your best op option. Uh, a lot of the guys, especially the ARL people, uh, go to Zurich because they can go nonstop from Boston to Zurich, and then so they only have one flight. They just have the overseas leg, and then they catch the train on the uh, Zurich end uh, to get to. Uh, uh, if you're going to go, make sure that all your gadgets have their chargers work on both voltages. Most now do. I was surprised that I didn't have a handheld charger or digital camera charger or cell phone charger that didn't work on both. They say uh, uh, 100 uh, to 240 volts, 50, 60 hertz. If that's what it says, you don't need a transformer. All you need is a little adapter. You can get fries for about three or four bucks that changes the straight prongs to the two round prongs. Cost about four bucks and plugs in just fine. Um, now operate there. If you got a technician license, you are SOL because the CEPT agreement between us and Europe does not allow for American techs to operate. General or higher can operate with their current privileges uh, under the reciprocal agreement. Uh, the CEPT letter can be uh, downloaded from the ARL webpage. It's like a three-page letter. I just printed it, folded it up, and put a photocopy of my American license in the pouch of my briefcase. So if they ask me a custom, I had it. I was never asked if I had that letter, but I was asked when they x-rayed my bag uh, if I had a walkie-talkie in there, and uh, that was it. It was not, not a big deal. Um, if you're going to go there, I always tell people reserve the rooms now because just like they, they fill up pretty quick and watch the airfares. A lot of times, this time of the year is a real good time to buy fares for next summer. The, that's the good deal. The bad deal is between now and next summer, the flight schedules may change. So you might find your uh, flight times a little bit different. Uh, next time, uh, next slide. Okay. This was our ride uh, on my day trip. I did a day trip to uh, Munich from Friedrichshafen, and that's about the distance of like going from here to Kansas City, about 180 to 200 miles, and. Uh, uh, it goes a lot quicker when you're in a train that's going 140 miles an hour. But uh, we had to take a regional train from Friedrichshafen uh, about 70 miles up the road and then make a connection to one of these higher speed trains, which uh, got us to Munich. Uh, when you're going 140 miles an hour in a train, and by the way, that's one of the slow high speed trains. The faster ones go as fast as 280 miles an hour. It really does not clickety clacking, bounce like you're used to American trains. These guys are on time within about 30 seconds, and it is extremely smooth inside, and you just don't even know you're going that fast. It's absolutely amazing and uh, an, an incredible experience. I think we can learn a lot from them. Uh, next slide. Okay. When you're in Friedrichshafen, Friedrichshafen is, is, has the symbol of the Zeppelin, and that's because that's where all the Zeppelins were made in the 1930s and 20s, uh, in the heyday of the Zeppelin era. Uh, this is a, in the Zeppelin Museum, which is in downtown Friedrichshafen, and this is a replica of the uh, observation lounge inside the gondola where the passengers traveled uh, of the Hindenburg. And so there's a lot of historical information in this museum about the Zeppelins and uh, specifically the Hindenburg itself. And you could spend a long time just in this museum learning about all the stuff in there. And they showed the HF radio that was in uh, one of the Zeppelins that came before the Hindenburg. And it's a tube type radio that in several different gasketed sealed cases, one inside the other, to make sure that no spark ignites the hydrogen, because they were not lifted by helium. 
They were lifted by hydrogen and so uh, very flammable. But yet, surprisingly, they had a smoking lounge in the thing, and uh, it was kind of double insulated and stuff to make sure that no hydrogen got in there. Uh, next slide. Okay. This is part of the QFO wall. Uh, if I was to estimate, I'd say this is about a quarter of what the wall is. And it's just incredible. In fact, uh, the Dayton Hand Engine is going to try and bring that tradition to Dayton. Uh, they tried it a little bit last year, but where they had it was too small and nobody knew about it. Nobody knew where it was. So Dayton is going to try to uh, bring that tradition uh, from Europe. You'll notice that most of the QSL cards people put up there are not the simple letters and state outlines or country outlines and things like you and I use here. Most all of them have some kind of photo QSL card, and uh, they, a lot of them put ours to shame. There's some really, really beautiful QSL cards. Uh, next slide. Okay. While I was there was the World Cup going on. In fact, on Thursday night while we were there was the U.S. versus Germany. And so, of course, that was on the big screen TV at the Hamfest while everybody was setting up uh, on one wall in, in the uh, uh, main building. You can see this. And uh, half the people setting up would just kind of stop and watch that instead of doing their work. So it was very interesting. And, of course, that night they beat us. And all you saw was cars going up and down the main street, honking their horns with German flags stuck on them, just like here in Nebraska, there was a Husker flag, and there was a Iowa flag. So it was quite something, and a lot of fun, but really uh, good sportsmanship and uh, a good spirit. Next slide. Okay. In the flea market, I saw a lot of these, what I would call Cold War era military radios. And some of them, like the one in front of you, had Cyrillic uh, uh, alphabet, uh, Cyrillic writing on the front, which obviously means it was a Russian-made as opposed to American. So you saw Russian-made man packs and American-made man packs side by side. And the hands there use a lot more of those that they have restored than the American hands use because obviously they had access to a lot of these during the Cold War era as they became surplus, they didn't bring them back here. So you had a lot of American and a lot of uh, Russian or origin uh, military uh, man pack radios, side band, CW, and so forth. And uh, so I saw a lot of people not only uh, dealing and wheeling and dealing with them, but actually using them out in the courtyard area. And I had a lot of fun playing with one uh, on 40 meters. And they had like a, a little net going on in the ham fest uh, using the man pack on HF. Uh, next slide. Okay. This is the flea market. This is one of two of the halls that held the flea market. So each one was identical in size. Uh, this is, of course, besides the main commercial exhibit area that you'll see in the uh, musical slideshow. Um, the stuff that you saw at the flea market there was just like here. How many ham radio flea markets have you been to that somebody wasn't selling those darn little radio-controlled helicopters and drones, right? Same thing there. Uh, it's just like the, the world is not different. Like I said, the only difference was uh, the old antique radios. There was a lot of old Grundig telefunkins and, and so forth, uh, European, uh, European-made radios. I have an old telefunkin AM, FM tube radio in my basement, and the mistake I made of my life was to not write down the European tube numbers because there were tube vendors there, and they didn't have the American number tubes, but they had all the European number tubes that I would have needed. So next time I go, I'm sure it's not going to be next year, but at some point in the future, I'll make sure I bring my tube list with me. Uh, people are really, really nice. Um, the flea market vendors aren't all from Germany. In fact, if you look on a map where Friedrich Thompson is, we were only 30 minutes drive from Austria and just across the, uh, the lake from Switzerland. Of course, both of those speak uh, uh, German. But you had France, which was only a couple hours away. Italy was only about a four-hour drive away. And Croatia and Hungary and Slovenia were a little farther yet. 
but they, they weren't that far away, and so you had a lot of people that spoke all sorts of different languages. So the guy from Poland who was selling 70 megahertz uh, uh, down converters and stuff and transverters for the 70 megahertz band, which we don't have here, they call it four meters, um, they uh, uh, would ask the German guy to speak English because they want to speak German and the German guy didn't know Polish. So most people spoke English. So it wasn't too bad uh, negotiating in the flea market. You could negotiate there just like you could here. Next slide. Yep. Here's the guy you might be familiar with. That's Norm from ARL headquarters. And he's uh, heading up the DXCC work on state card checking there. Um, and they would, uh, as you see next to his hand, there's bundles of paperwork with QSL cards bundled up, and then he sent it over to the table, and uh, there was a whole team working on those, and you'll probably see that in uh, one of my slides in the video slideshow. Um, but the ARL has a pretty big presence there, and it's mostly there, they, they do sell a few of their books and so forth, but it's mostly for doing uh, DXCC card checking and dealing with contest issues and things like that and other awards uh, while they're there. And they, the guys there just love doing it because that means they don't have to send their QSL cards away. They can give it to them in the morning and come back later in the afternoon and pick up their cards and have the uh, award either printed there or mailed to them. Next slide. They should be kid building. Yes. Okay, the, if you're looking at this slide, the instructors are the people on the right, and the students are the ones on the left. And you can see that a lot of the instructors are at least as young as the students. And uh, like the boy in the blue shirt, kind of halfway down on the left, he's like uh, 10 or 11 years old. And they had me sit down in front of him for a while and, and be an instructor. And I said, how am I going to do this? Because I don't speak German. And the kid looked at me and said, but I speak English. And so it was pretty good. I could do it in English. Um, uh, the construction technique that they use for their kit, I talk about quite a bit in the September issue of CQ, that yeah, you actually will get it, that in the mail in the next few days. Uh, August that came out, September should be following very shortly. And the way they do this is they have a block of wood and then they have a sticker that they put on it that has the component layout, what value parts go where, and then it has these black dots. And what they do is they pound these brass tacks into the board onto the black dot. And then they put a dab of solder onto each one of those. And then they bend the component leads and they fit it down on each one and heat it up and so it sticks there and then they just trim the excess lead off. So it's kind of like what we call Manhattan construction, but it's done with tacks that are stuck onto wooden blocks. And it actually looks pretty cool. And you'll see in my uh, musical slideshow what the finished product looks like. Now the square board that most of the younger kids were doing was making a, pro uh, uh, a project called Cotton which is cat's eyes. And all it did was it had two LEDs. Uh, that switch between red and green, and they had an oscillator that goes back and forth slowly, so it goes red, green, red, green with the uh, cast on. Next slide. Yes. Something to be cautious of when, when you're at any large gathering in Europe is there can be pickpockets and so forth, so of course they're warning the vendors and stuff to be careful and make sure this stuff is locked. Just like any other ham theft, uh, Unfortunately, that's a fact of life, but I, I thought the uh, symbol was kind of cute with the guy with the Euro bag. Uh, next slide. Every day, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at noon, if you came to the French booth, which wasn't very far from us, that was where the big party is. Mm -hmm. If you see the two big <coughs> white boxes on the table, that's uh, French wine, uh, and I think one was French champagne. Uh, in boxes and had a little spigot on it. Of course, they're filling the cups and they had all sorts of cookies, candies, and treats and stuff from France. And so every day it was a must do if you knew what was going on to go over to their booth and uh, uh, 
uh, have a drink and eat some of the French ham. Very, very friendly bunch. It's really, truly a neat international experience. Uh, that is the end of the PowerPoint part. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions?